For four years, this little car has taken me to and from work to greener lands filled with fluffy cows, get me dry in adverse weather, get me safe from dangerous drivers, been stolen yet recovered, and most importantly, put a smile on my face when it came to some twisty corners. Just pulls you around. It's just insane. What about when I wasn't on a twisty road though? Was it all smiles per mile? Or was it a near grin, short lived? Well, it was actually a bit of both. Let's talk about it. My name's Tom, and you're watching Paragon Cars. Let's go. still hard for me to believe I picked this little beauty up four years ago, but here we are. I suppose time flies when you're having fun. Now if you don't know the Cupra, it's effectively a front wheel drive version of the VW Golf R and Audi S3. It uses the VAQ differential up front to help put the power down instead of the very similar Haldex all wheel drive system. Now unlike your typical limited slip diff, the VAQ uses clutches to engage which actually allows it to have a varying degree of lock. In turn, this negates all the negative side effects of a regular LSD, like snappy steering response and behavior. To sum it up, it's less snappy, more comfortable, yet almost as effective as a proper LSD. Then, the engine. Supposedly, it's got 286 horsepower compared to the 296 of the Golf R. Remember, these are OPF cars, so they do have a little less horsepower than their slightly older cousins. But if you chuck these on a dyno, they basically always make the same 300 to 310 horsepower. It's a cracking engine and has been completely fault free over the four years that I've had it. Not even had any oil consumption, which I think is pretty impressive. I think reliability issues with these arise when people don't service them properly, as the only real issue I've heard of and seen fairly commonly is the thermostat housing cracking over time. Then in terms of interior, this is where the Cupra does fall a bit short mainly just in terms of the seats. The leather on the bolsters is pretty cheap, so they do unfortunately wear very easily over time. Not the end of the world, but something to look out for. Then the infotainment, it's simple to use, comes with Apple CarPlay as standard, and for the most part is pretty reliable. There's been the odd occasion where I've had to reset it as it wouldn't recognize my phone being plugged in, but overall a pretty decent system. The virtual cockpit is responsive and actually has more customization than the equivalent Golf R. Right, enough stationary stuff. Let's get moving and go for a final drive. Four years. Four years of my life, four years of the car's life. And that is it. Tomorrow this car will be going back. Well, it'll be going to BCA actually, British Car Auctions and then it'll be sold at auction. But what has this Cooper been like to own in that four year period? So when I first bought the car, I noticed there was a uh, bit of noise coming from the suspension. And this was a brand new car at the time, obviously, which is not something you really want in your brand new car. Thankfully, that eventually got resolved. Turns out it was just a loose nut or bolt or something. And um, ever since then, the car has literally been faultless. Just standard maintenance, tires, brakes, oil changes, filter changes. And that's it. That's literally it. This has been a surprisingly cheap hot hatch to own. Even in terms of fuel, I've been going from 180 pounds to about 300 pounds a month in fuel and I have not been driving it like a granny the whole time you know in the winter months you kind of just leave it in comfort mode and let it do its thing because you can't really push a front wheel drive car in winter and have fun with it and that's where the 180 pound a month figure comes from and then 300 pounds a month is just driving it in sports mode 
all the time, or Cupra. So yeah, fundamentally not that expensive to own. Then in terms of maintenance, also fairly cheap. You know, go to a specialist garage, don't go directly to say it themselves, because they will just rip you off like every other dealership does. Go to a specialist, and oil changes of around £150. Things like tyres, it's like £150 um, per tyre for really nice, like Michelin PS4 S's or PS5s. And brakes, I spent £189 on two new front discs and pads. Those are Brembo brakes as well, so, you know, proper stuff. So overall, this car has been surprisingly cheap to run and thankfully completely fault free get it in sports traction control off and this is a surprisingly fun car one thing I love is the fact they gave you DCC as standard which just means it's like a proper hot hatch then you can actually feel the road beneath you and in the corners, where there's not a lot of traffic, this is a bit of a weapon. But it's also quite quick. For supposedly 290 horsepower, it's about 306 actually. It's a lot of marketing. It is basically just the Golf R engine. This is a quick car. Because you've got pretty closely spaced gears and a very snappy dual clutch box. And third gear is where it's at in every hot hatch, just. And it sounds okay, it's a two litre engine. It's nothing crazy. But it's nice, you know, not too loud. So if you're buying one of these, probably put an exhaust on it. At least get a resonator delete, that makes a bit of a difference. It's <laughs> it's a VW product, so it's very good at going quickly and not throwing a fuss, shall I say. Not super duper exciting, but it's not boring either. It's a very, very capable car for what it is. And you know, if you want a car for track days, this is fantastic. Even the standard brakes are just okay enough to take it to a track. You can do a couple of laps and then you kind of, you get most of the way through the pedal. Um, so if you want a car that does, you know, proper track days, you might have to upgrade the brakes on this, but it's fantastic. I mean, you can leave it at stock power and it's easily quick enough to keep up with a lot of much more expensive, faster cars. That's why I like it. It's it's basically a bargain for what it is. It's not that expensive to run. It looks nice, sounds okay, it's fun to drive, or fun enough to drive. And just overall a really tidy package. You get everything you want as standard. Even things like auto fold mirrors. In Audi's you have to pay for those. And that's part of the reason why I bought it in the first place, because it just had everything I wanted. You know, stuff like Apple CarPlay, dual zone climate control. You get USB ports in the back for passengers. It's all those small things that make a big difference. And because it's got like a more sportier side to it than something like an Audi S3 or Golf R, it's just got a bit more flair. It's just a bit more enjoyable to drive. In terms of quirks, since I've had the car, there haven't been that many. Um, only thing I will mention is that road noise is quite high in this even for a hatchback so something like a VW Golf R it's about 5% quieter than this Audi S3 another 10% like in total about 15% quieter so if you want something that's well insulated I probably wouldn't go for one of these but do you know what you do kind of just get used to it it's not the end of the world in terms of rattles they seem to be a bit weird, you know, during winter when plastics are brittle. You do get the odd rattle here and there. But I have to say, for what is like fairly cheap plastic, 
it's done all right. You know, at the minute, there seems to be pretty much no rattles in a four-year-old car that is filled with cheap plastic. <laughs> so, yeah, not bad. Um, anything I don't like, really, is the cup holders. They're in a weird place, and not having grippy bits means it is kind of annoying when you've got a drink that either won't fit or it just kind of shakes around. The ones in the Golf are a lot better, so that is definitely something to keep in mind. But genuinely, for the money, I don't think you're going to find a better car than this. Let's give it some. Um... Also, put good tyres on the front, but put cheap tyres on the back. Now, you might be thinking, why on earth would you want to do that, put Michelins all around? However, if you want slightly better handling characteristics, then putting crappy tyres on the back means you get a bit more oversteer. I don't mean like, sort of like really crappy tyres, put like hand cooks on the back. Or you can even go for all seasons if you want. And it just means on faster roads, you get a really nice balance. Also, putting good tyres on the front means you get a lot more grip when you put your foot down. Stock, you'll get a lot of wheel hop in this, which is basically where you're going da -da 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 -da, like juddering. And that's mainly because it's got a lot of torque and it's trying to send all that power through the front wheels. And you can get a power flex uh, insert that you can put in, but it, you know, it makes a bit of noise. I found, so I've just left the car stock, you know, I think it's good enough as it is, you learn how to drive around it, I think. So yeah, things to keep in mind, road noise is quite high on this, cup holders aren't amazing, sound system is surprisingly good actually for a stock system, it's fairly comparable to a stock system in an Audi S3, which I wasn't expecting, I was expecting it to be really bad. But it's just about good enough at full volume to give you, you know, enough bass, mids, all that kind of stuff. And uh, enjoy music. And tyres, good tyres on the front, crappy tyres on the back, or just average tyres on the back. And then learn how to drive it. It's as simple as that, really. You have to drive around the wheel hop. Most front wheel drive hot hatches have the same issue. This one is particularly bad, though, I will say. Like, especially in first gear, if you lose if you use launch control, it's really bad. It just goes da -da 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 -da, or you get like just big smoky burnouts, which is actually a bit more interesting than the uh, wheel hop. But yeah, nothing's broken on the car. It's got everything I want. You've got little storage things under the seats, which is great, and then you've got another cubby here as well that you can store your sunglasses in. It's just a really well thought out car. You've got all the USB ports that you need, and it's just got all the options that you want as well. You know, maybe bar heated seats. But if you want those, you can go for the Lux Pack, which gives you things like a wireless charger, adaptive cruise control, and the aforementioned heated seats. But again, for the money, this is a seriously good deal. You can get a 2019 one of these for around £20,000. And that's a good one as well, you know, you're not getting something ropey. So you'll have like full service history, cars being looked after. Only thing um, that I found quite weird is I went to Sayre asking about the VAQ or VAC diff in the front um, and when it needed servicing and they said, oh it doesn't have a diff. <laughs> I said, well, it does. Um, it's a bit worrying that you're telling me it doesn't because I know it does and it needs servicing apparently and they said oh oh yeah it's got one but it's a sealed for life unit um, so yeah basically rule of thumb don't take your car to the dealership to get serviced I initially had a service plan on this and I used the first service and they left oil all over the engine bay um, which is just rude really isn't it you can at least just clean up after yourselves. And 
and um, yeah, I didn't even use the second service. I went to a specialist after that, and it was much better. You know, they actually know what they're talking about as well. So yeah, rule of thumb: don't go to the dealership, and they're more expensive anyway. And in terms of insurance, I had this when I was a fairly youngish driver, and I was paying well about eighteen hundred pounds living in London and for insurance. I then got a couple of no claims discount bonus years and uh, it went down to a thousand pounds which is not bad for a little hot hatch like this. Also more on insurance actually because this is effectively the same as something like a Golf GTI TCR or I mean it's like a S3 or Golf R but without the four-wheel drive system. A VW Golf R in terms of insurance was coming out at over £4,000 a year for me which is just ridiculous. I'm, I refuse to pay that amount of money to an insurance company. And this was coming out to 1800. Why is that? I mean, obviously there's reasons, but like, that's a lot cheaper. So overall, if you're looking for something similar to a Golf R, that's a bit more fun, and actually cheaper to run fundamentally, this is a really genuinely good choice. I really don't think you can find a better deal than this. It's surprising just how good this car is. And people can take these up to, you know, above 600 horsepower if they want to, which is uh, kind of unnecessary because as soon as you get to figures like that, there's no grip until you're in like fourth gear in the dry, so never really understood that one. I think it's got enough power as it is, really. All you want is enough power to have fun with. Look at these roads, absolutely shocking. The only thing I would change really is the exhaust. Just get a proper Scorpion catback system put on it and that's about it. It sounds all right, doesn't it? A couple of pops and bangs. Also, the other thing you should do is turn off that sound actor because eventually they just start rattling and then it just sounds awful. <laughs> I thought I'd leave it on so the next owner can have fun turning it off. Such a strong engine. I have to say, I think, personally, this is probably one of the best 2 litre engines ever made. The potential for power is just enormous. And you just keep up with regular maintenance oil change every sort of nine, ten thousand miles or so, use good oil, and that's it. And a bit more on fuel actually, so if I were to go down to like a quarter of a tank from a full tank, you'd get about 240 miles out of that. That's driving around town, you know, not really worrying about MPG figures, so it's pretty decent really. And my trip up to the Isle of Mull, I got all the way to Mull from London on a single tank of petrol, driving just at motorway speeds. So I was very impressed with that actually. So on the motorway, you can quite easily get about 45 miles per gallon out of this thing. In fact, I did a test a while ago to see just how high I could get that MPG figure. And I actually managed to get 51 miles per gallon <laughs> on, a, I think it was a 120 mile journey, which is just crazy for a 300 horsepower 2 litre turbocharged engine. That really is impressive. So including the monthly finance cost, which to me was £293 a month, with no deposit, I know, try getting that now. Fuel, 180 to £300 a month. Insurance, another, I don't know, £116 a month. You could budget 700 quid a month, and that gives you everything. That gives you the car, just crazy, isn't it? 700 quid a month for everything. For a hot hatch as well, which, you know, is not bad. You'd struggle doing a lot cheaper in a normal car, really. Oh, one other thing I wanted to mention was that the start-stop is dumb in this. Get that coded out or turn it off, because with it on, it seems to cut the engine out before you actually come to a complete stop. And it is supposed to do that, but it always does it when you're like at junctions and stuff, when 
when you're just about to go, it turns the engine off. So you end up having this like half a second delay where you've seen a gap, gone for it, and then the car just goes, uh, no, you're not going anywhere. And that's actually really annoying. So yeah, leave that off or get it coded out. I'm pretty sure if you go for like a Revo uh, stage one map, it actually codes out the start stop anyway. One last time. So yeah, if you're thinking about buying one of these, I would just go right ahead and do it, to be honest. But for me, it's time to jump into something a little bit more me, I think. The Cooper is fun, but I think it's had its time.